This is the Youth Worker Collective Podcast. We have your back with everything from games, lessons, and coaching. YouthworkerCollective.com. Welcome to the Youth Worker Collective Podcast. I'm Jeremy Steele, and I am here with a fellow United Methodist elder, uh, pastor of Fair Oaks United Methodist Church, and uh, an incredible speaker who, um, for those of you who are at Youth 2019, got to experience all of her interesting creativity uh, in the morning Bible studies. And actually, that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today, is kind of how to make the Bible come alive, how to be creative with the scriptures, at the same time being responsible with them when we're teaching them as youth workers. So, uh, Kim, thank you so much for being on the podcast. And uh, if you don't mind, kind of for those people who were not at Youth 2019, can you just give us a quick uh, what is it that you did uh, for the Bible study? You and uh, Dave, right? Uh, Dale. Yeah. Thanks, Dale. Jeremy, for the invite. Um, Dale and I took uh, the story of the prodigal son because we feel like everybody can find themselves in that story, whether you're a kid or a youth worker or an adult. Um, you find yourself in that story somewhere, either as the father, the um, younger son or the older son. Um, And so what we started with was uh, writing those as a way to enter into the story on a deep level. And so Dale and I broke up the parts. Um, Dale wrote the male parts. So writing uh, monologues for the father, the older son and the younger son. And then um, I took what I thought were equally important elements of the story that we often either don't think about and for sure don't hear about. The female parts. So what does the mother have to say about her son taking his inheritance and leaving? What does the uh, little sister who gets nothing anyway have to say about um, her brother deciding to leave? And also a, quote, helpful neighbor who's worried about the cultural implications of what what does this mean if he changes how traditionally they have done uh, the the inheritance um, Mm -hmm. disbursement. So um yeah it was a fun project to work on and i probably had more liberty than dale because uh there wasn't uh there wasn't anything there for me to work with (laughs) but i'm pretty sure people had had feelings if you know although we know the women in the bible often aren't named but for certain their presence is felt so um so how do you do that like you know um obviously uh, in this story you you said there's there's what those women characters are not there um, so how do you, how did you start kind of this creative process? Like, because I, I think that the thing that people are, uh, are maybe afraid of when being creative with the scriptures, um, is, uh, is being somehow irresponsible with them. So yeah. how did you, how did you begin this idea, uh, begin with this idea, uh, in, in regards to the scripture? So first we took the Bible and poured over that story. Dale wrote his scripts and I used my scripts to weave around his, what he had already written. Okay. So I locked myself in a hotel room for about a week. Awesome. (laughs) And um, just looked at the scripture, did some deep prayer and did some deep dive on culturally what would be expected at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, What would be expected in terms of the role of women in terms of, uh, their particular role in the family, uh, or community. And, um, so I put myself, you know, I used empathy, right? I think, um, if we're going to discover the role of women in the Bible, we need to have moral imagination, meaning Mm -hmm. we need to imagine what that would be like, Mm -hmm. um, and look at that from a, a moral aspect of the responsibility, not of just how I would feel in 2019, right. but how would a woman at that time need to be reacting? So for example, in my um, monologue for the mom, the father pulls uh, the son, the son before asking for the inheritance pulls the father aside, asking for the money. Well, Mm -hmm. the mother uh, is struggling with, well, what's he talking about? How do I figure out what's going on? What if my husband doesn't make the right decision? And yet I don't have a voice. Right. Right. So how do I, uh, how am I still able to exert my power and, um, and, and, and find out what's going on with, uh, with my son 
Um, and so she does what women probably have done for centuries is cook a meal, right? have people sit around and talk. And she waits for her husband to say what's going on. And the particular interest for the, for the mother in that story is if her son takes the inheritance now and squanders it, she mm. could essentially become a beggar on the street. Yeah, right. And so um, her out of everyone in that story has a vested interest in him being responsible because um, she'll end up with nothing. Right. So, so you, you said you kind of tried to get into the cultural background. How did you do that? Like what, what resources did you use to, to help you along the way there? Um, I really like using the new interpreters Bible okay. as a starting point for the, the historical context. Um, I use text week often for the, some exegesis work to do that. Um, I read commentaries and then I dive in. Um, and also I think about how I would be at that age or in that place, um, mm -hmm. for the role of the younger sister who gets nothing anyway, who's not able to go to Hebrew school because, um, in order for her at that time to be educated, she would need to be a rich Greek girl. Mm -hmm. I modeled her life on what it would be like to be a young woman in Africa currently, okay. um, traveling to get water, not able to go to school in some locations unless her family was, you know, extremely wealthy. And so looking at also shedding some light on some of our more um, traditional and tribal societies um, have a lot to say about how the biblical context is understood yeah. for us in a different context. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um so after you did that work, I wonder, is there, um, were you writing towards a specific uh, bottom line or idea? Did you sort of map out um, where, like what you were trying to say before you actually got into the sort of creative process of the, of the monologue? Or did you, did, did you do it the other way around? You sort of did the monologue and, and, and then kind of figured out where the point was. You know, the great part about the um, prodigal son is the story's open, mm -hmm. right? We end that story with the father still outside. Nothing is really resolved other mm -hmm. than knowing about the presence of God's love. And isn't that our lives, right? Like none right. of it's wrapped up in a nice bow of like, here you go. This is what's going to happen in this situation. Um, and so this story in particular uh, lends itself to being open. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't have to end somewhere. Uh, the mother is worried about uh, her son leaving, but also experiences the joy of him coming home. And also, we didn't necessarily pick our monologues to be at the same time. Right. So the mother is worried about the son leaving. The um, nosy neighbor, who understands herself to be helpful, experiences him coming home. Mm -hmm. And the little sister is upset the fact that she's just not treated equally or fairly throughout this whole thing. Right. Right. Um, so uh, I didn't, we didn't end up, I really just tried to get in the, in the, in the idea. It really it made me, uh, my inspiration for this was Lin-Manuel Miranda. Not at all. Hallelujah. Uh, yes. Thank you. Because <laughs> he is a, a patron saint. Um, yes. And so one of the things when he was writing Moana, what he did was um, they said, how do you as a, you know, 40 year old man know what it's <laughs> like to be a, an island girl? And he's like, well, I know what it's like to be 12 and feel the pressure of your family constraints and living underneath that. So he locked himself in his childhood bedroom to write Moana to remember oh, wow. what that time in your phase in life was. And so Part of it, I think, is just entering with openness and empathy, right? Of like, yeah. where does this take me? Um, it was easy for me to see in the role of mother because I have mm -hmm. kids, right? And, right? and all the emotions around that. I've been a little girl who had a brother who I felt like, gosh, he really gets everything. You know, so that part right. is easy. And uh, the neighbor, um, we're all worried about change. Right. And what the implications of what other people do and the impact it'll have on our lives. So um, those roles were really natural to me. And I think it's important to have people who obviously maybe if they aren't, obviously I'm not a first century Jewish woman. Right. Um, <laughs> FYI, I know it's a podcast and you well, can't see me, but that is a fact. Thank um, you for clearing that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I can understand what, what, um, what I believe about the Bible is that there are eternal truths that are being told 
and those truths don't ever fade. Right. And so, right. um, the longing for a mother, for her son, um, and the worry has existed as long as there's been mothers and sons, right. Sibling rivalry, well-documented, I don't know, all throughout the Bible and in our personal lives. Um, so, so those eternal truths, I, I leaned onto what are the, what are the themes that are weaving throughout the Bible in, in the first century Jewish culture? And what are we still experiencing here today? Yeah. Just trying to tell the story of tonight, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so, um, I, you know, I was thinking as you, as you were talking about that process, um, uh, one of the, one of the, I think, persons that paved the way for some of this really great cre creativity with the scripture was um, a guy named Phil Vischer, who did, uh, who was the originator of the VeggieTales series. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I remember reading an, uh, uh, an interview with him where he talked about their process was they sort of um, uh, established that they'd sit in a room and establish like, what are the, what is the main point of this? Like, what are the, what is the core of the story? And then yes. once they establish the core of the story, like literally everything else is up for grabs, which yeah. I love because there's this, they do this one about David and Bathsheba, which you think is not a children's story. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's funny because, you know, in the story, David is really just objectifying um, Bathsheba. And um, and so Bathsheba turns into a rubber duck. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and David's character has a closet full of rubber ducks. Uh, but he mm. looks out and he sees a rubber duck that he wants. That he doesn't have. That is yeah. someone else's yeah. rubber duck and he takes it. Um, <laughs> but... There's so much. I, I love it because it, when you when you watch it, knowing that knowing what story it is, you're like, wow, man, that's that like challenges me on a whole different level. Like treating people like that, and um, so how do you how did you guys go about establishing um, either just kind of in your mind or 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 more formally what the core of the story was? And and, and I guess then that question is really what is the core of the story for you? Mm. Wow. Uh, great question, host Jeremy Steele. Um, <laughs> I think the core of the prodigal son story is longing. Uh huh. Yeah. And everybody is longing in different ways for different things. Almost, um, I, I don't want to say stereotypically, but in a way, stereotypically from where they are in their life, right? Right. Like, um, the, the, the younger brother longs for freedom and to be able to do, to make his, make his own destiny. Right. Which mm -hmm. when we're young is so important to us of like forging our own way in the world to, to shake off uh, the, what we see as shackles of our parents and our culture. And, you know, depending on where you live, your hometown and um, expectations and um, mm -hmm. all of that. And the, the mother and so for my characters in particular right like the mother longing for her son to be mm -hmm. okay she doesn't know i mean there was no email there was no text message there was no snapchat she has no idea if he's dead or alive right and yeah. so one of the lines is the neighbor says do you think he's married a gentile girl and like <laughs> <gasps> oh right. like the shame right and so um longing to just even know if her son's alive um yeah more than the security of like, is my son even alive? Right. Um, for the sister to be a value, to see, mm -hmm. uh, to be seen, right? Mm -hmm. um, that I'm, it doesn't matter if I'm smart. Mama says, one of the lines I have is mama says, girls do different things with their day. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want to do different things with my day. Um, and so I think, and, and from the neighbor of longing for um, everything to be harmonious. Yeah. Um, but the greater truth in that for me is also the other, you know, it's the, the role of the father, but the, but uh, God is always longing for us to yeah. be in relationship and deep relationship. Right. Um, mm -hmm. That type of longing is, is desirable and it is um, it's really gentle and beautiful. Um, and we sometimes make it more complicated with all of our longing on top of that. Right. But it's really the longing of the father on the porch 
who in, at the end of the story is still outside the party um, mm-hmm. with the brother who's longing for it to be different. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, I guess uh, in Lin-Manuel language, you know, wishing that that would be enough for him, right? Oh, so <laughs> one of my favorite uh, parts of Youth 2019 is I had embedded Hamilton quotes in my monologue. Praise. And one girl on the last day comes up to me in a small voice and says, um, excuse me, ma'am, did you intentionally quote Hamilton? <laughs> I wheeled because every day I put a Hamilton quote in each of my monologues. Right, right. And um, so I had the, the the younger brother say, I'm past patiently waiting. I'm um, tired of waiting. I'm snatching every expectation. <laughs> And for the little sister, I had her say, Mama whispered to me, do you want to be a poor man's wife? <laughs> <laughs> so then after I squealed, she squealed. And I was like, you are my people. I love it. Yeah. So um, That's great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so basically what you're saying is you didn't throw away your shot when you, <laughs> for <laughs> 2019. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're going for the obvious <laughs> yes but i was also like awesome wow <laughs> <laughs> so um now kind of kind of dialing this back in for youth workers um you know uh, who are uh you know trying to harness the their students creativity trying to engage them in the story uh of scripture um, you know, trying to capture the same sort of things that Lin Manuel is able to capture, right? Uh, when yeah. he yeah. finds, you know, the the power in, um, you know, Hamilton or Moana or uh, Mary Poppins, you know, <laughs> right. uh, how how do we do that? Like, where does a youth worker um, who's got you know a couple kids in their youth group and is trying to help them be creative with the scriptures. Um, where do they start trying to help them do some of the things that you guys did at youth 2019? Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, first, I think that you have to realize the most ways that all of us coming to in contact with scripture, um, and especially for youth, cause they're probably not going home and reading their Bible and devotional daily. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, is, having scripture read at us. And I say at us very intentionally because it's chopped up. It's in small little parts. It's on Sunday morning or someone who's incredibly nervous um, usually is reading. And so it's read as if you are reading um, as I'm talking to you now, very, very uh, there's no, there's no depth. There's no pause. There's no, no um, richness to that way that we read it. And so often that also colors how we engage. So we don't go into it with depth and richness. Um, we have it read at us and then wait for someone to tell us um, what it says. And so what I think is important is making the stories come alive because everything mm-hmm. every teenager is ever struggling with is contained in these collection of stories, yeah. which means you're not unique, you're not yeah. alone, and there's power in that. Right. Um, And so I think that the first thing that you have to do is stop reading scripture. uh, Not, I mean, entirely uh, for in the, in the way to do it, the way Dale and I do did it. I think you have to stop reading scripture um, at at that way. You have to start thinking, what is the story going back to? What is the story communicating? Mm -hmm. What are the elements in it? And I think you have a moral obligation to say whose voices are not being heard here. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's whose voices true. are missing from this story? <clears throat> because that's essential, right? Like, yeah. I'm pretty sure a mom had something to say about her son taking his inheritance and walking away. Yeah. I, I can guarantee that. <laughs> yeah, um, it's it's just that those voices weren't valued at that time. Mm-hmm. So part of my question is always whose voice is not being heard at this table, and um, it can feel really uncomfortable to do this because it feels like you're writing scripture, but mm-hmm. you're not you are representing the viewpoint that was there that we're not hearing. That's just not recorded. And so um, I think it's important if there is a a male voice that's being lifted up, um, I think it's important to have a counter female voice that's heard. 
And or then, if there's an adult verse, uh, you know, an adult voice yes. to have uh, a teenage voice. And I think, you know, like uh, teenagers, I mean, there's a million things they haven't done. And they, they think that, um, that these sorts of things are off limits for them um, because they only see the adult side, but allowing them to sort of access the story and, and put the things that they have experienced uh, into it, um, then then it helps them to to embody to sort of embody that story in the rest of their life for sure i had I, a couple men middle-aged men stopped me on the street and were like i will never look at scripture the same way again after <laughs> hearing it from that perspective because um i don't think we ask oh what does the mom think about this you know um mm-hmm. sunday morning isn't the place often to do that which makes when youth workers are getting together with their youth even better because you're able yeah. to go in depth Um, teenagers are awesome at thinking of parallel universes and stories and experiences and um to say what about this why wasn't this raised and so i think if we're reading scripture responsibly that's actually what we need to do um and teenagers are great at that and so part of it for me that i was really concerned about (laughs) um was that it would be hokey yeah right i didn't want it to be to come off as like uh you know uh, wearing costumes and just being like, okay, you know, almost making char- <laughs> right. you know, making caricatures of it. Yeah, um, right. And so there was a fine line between um, entering into the story and not making it about being a play, right? right. Like, yeah, yeah, because that's it's that's not what it is. It's just we needed to shed some of who we were in right. order to enter in fully into that story. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think that takes vulnerability. I think that takes honesty. And I think that takes integrity. Integrity comes from sticking to the scripture. Right. Um, the vulnerability um, comes from saying, I'm willing to get this wrong. Right. Right. I don't need to, I don't need to be so attached to the idea that I'm, that I can't hear another perspective. Yeah. And the vulnerability, I mean, the, the stripping yourself is like, okay, less of me, more of the story, right? right. Like, yeah. if I look foolish, that's okay if people walk away with the story in a different view. Yeah. And, and I think that's somewhere where teens uh, are, are really good um, because, it, you know, I mean, just to be honest, because their prefrontal cortex doesn't hold them back. Sometimes, right. sometimes like the sky's the limit for them, right? For like sure. They can do whatever. Um, and that vulnerability, they have a little bit uh, easier access to it because they're, they, uh, you know, in, in other situations, it's a bad thing for them not to be held back. But right. in this kind of thing, they might, you, you find these like surprising utterances, right? Yeah. So I think there's actually, Jeremy, I think there's two ways you can kind of go about it. I think you can either enter yourself into that time or you can take those characters and enter them into our time. So what would it look like for a character? So take the the son who wants his inheritance early. Right. What does it mean for a kid right now who's not willing to wait? Yeah. What does that look like in terms of him uh, wanting to cash in his college money, maybe perhaps? to right. get a, a really boss Toyota truck or right. whatever, you know, like whatever that is. Yeah. So I think you can do it both ways. And one, it will connect with, you know, I think you can do it on, on both sides of the coin with different stories yeah. and enter, enter into that in different ways. And um, I think the second way of like taking uh, the characters and putting them in our time can sometimes be easier as an injury point for, for teenagers because they know that kid. Like they, right. they may be that kid, right? Yeah, right. Oh yeah. I, I don't want to wait, you know? Yeah. And so, okay. What does that look like? Right. Yeah. What would your mom say about that? You know? <laughs> right. And the, and then the, the other one who is willing to wait for it, you know, but yeah. it's like, you know, I, I love that kind of interplay between the, the two. And so, <clears throat> so here's like, here's the kind of, to kind of pull us into the, the uh, uh, kind of a landing strip here, uh, you know, how does a youth worker really sort of uh, take the horse by the reins and and make this happen in their group? Like, how do they? Um, what is the, the sort of first step? Do you think to to kind of getting this sort of create creativity, doing this sort of thing with your group? Um, I think for, if I was doing this with a group of teenagers, and first out, shout out to all youth workers because I mean yes. y'all are doing the bulk of the work. And while, you know, 
uh, adults do adult things. You guys are actually forming people's faith in a really authentic way. I think one of my joys of being a Methodist is that we encourage deep questioning, right? right. You don't yes. have to think a particular way. You don't have to um, behave a particular way in order to pass some church litmus test if you belong mm -hmm. here or not. And you all are teaching that faith. And I was just touched time and time again at uh, Youth 2019 by kids who are struggling with difficult stuff. And you guys yeah. were right along with them in a beautiful way of reminding us that God is always accompanying us and walking with us. And so just, I want to say thank you for that. Um, because, uh, this takes you being vulnerable and honest and risky as well. So, um, I think if I were doing this with a group, I would do it in teams, right. Mm -hmm. And have them do a character, uh, mock-up. I'd get maybe some of those big sticky notes and start there and just like write down the characteristics of this person. Mm -hmm. Who is, who is this person? Like down to like, what does their hair look like? What is their, yeah. like, just get in there. Right. And, and as much as possible. And then I would ask them, um, then after doing that in a small group, I would maybe open that up to a larger group and say, what do you see other than these characteristics that might be also part of that person? So, um, have a small group, do a deep dive, have a larger group, do a, a lighter dive, but, um, fleshing that out more also getting buy-in from everybody, mm -hmm. right? Like that requires everybody to, to buy in on, on that level. And then I would, um, I would ask someone to embody that role. Mm -hmm. And that's the risky part, right? Um, right? But I would, I wouldn't go full on props, but I would do something that stripped them of themselves. So right. um, like for me, I didn't do full on costume changes, but I threw a robe over or something that said I was different than who I was five minutes ago. Yeah. Um, because if I look down and see my same Nikes, if I look down and see my same um, shirt that I love or whatever it is, I remember myself, right? And so right. how am I able to be, you know, my constant prayer um, as a preacher, as a pastor, as a mom is less of me, more of you, right? Right? Like have it be less of me and more of God. And so um, to strip ourselves away a little bit and and to have that. And then I may have like, I may have them interact, right? Like now just say from the characteristics that we've said about these characters, show me what, and then reread, reread that scripture again, right before. How does this play out? Yeah. How does yeah. this go? Yeah. Um, and then I would maybe go, okay, let's add some other characters in there, right? Like, let's go, let's do what we see in the Bible. Let's throw the, the male figures up there. Mm -hmm. Oh, let's throw the female characters up there. Who else isn't in this picture, right? Like you right. can just make this bigger, like make that circle start small and just get bigger and bigger and bigger until either most people or all people are interacting in that um, skit almost. It's an, it's an improv. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that. And I think that's a, a great kind of first step for that. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, thank you so much for for spending some time with us and uh, uh, showing us how uh, we can get the job done with doing this creativity, uh, these sort of creative approaches to the scripture. Um, but if uh, I, I know that you um, obviously you spoke for, at Youth 2019, um, but you actually do that on the regular. So how if people are wanting to find you? Um, uh, how do they get a hold of you? What's the, what's the best place to find you online? Uh, the best place would probably actually right now be email. Okay. Want, want, old school. Um, Kim Montenegro, K-I-M-M-O-N-T-E-N-E-G-R-O at gmail.com. My maiden name was Brown and it was way easier. I didn't know I'd be spelling <laughs> it out for this long. Uh, so, yeah, my kids took a long time to learn how to spell their last name. Oh, oh, wow, the struggle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much, Kim. But now I feel like we've got to teach them how to say goodbye. Um, so <laughs> we're going to... Oh, my gosh, I love it. It's getting better and better. Now we need a whole separate podcast on Lynn and Miranda Coates. I can do that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we are, uh, you know, when you sit down to work as a youth pastor, so many times... Sometimes uh, you, you don't, you're not in the room with somebody else um, and it can feel lonely. Uh, yes. We don't want you to feel alone. Uh, that's what we do at the Youth Worker Collective. Uh, when you sit down to work, I want you to know that we've got your back with games, ideas, lessons, coaching, um, really all that you need. 
at youthworkercollective.com. And you can find more podcasts like this one at uh, youthworkercollective.com slash podcast.